Protect your wooden clarinet and get the most out of your reeds with Bovada two-way humidity control packs. Watch until the end of this video to learn more. Then head to bovadainc.com and use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase of Bovada products. Welcome back to the Clarinet Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the, to the show for clarinetists live on the internet here now, which is great to have. And you know what? We've got a special guest, uh, probably one of the most special guests to come on the show, Michael Lowenstern. He's been an inspiration of mine for a really, really long time. I remember the first time I saw him live way back in like 2007, probably at Clarinet Fest in Vancouver. Um, but he's been a real kind of uh, inspiration for this podcast, giving me lots of, you know, push along the way to keep it going. And uh, even let me use some of his great music, which I loved for a lot of years on the show. And uh, like any good mentor, though, always got some tough love in there. Recently, I was like, hey, I want to get maybe let's do a, a, a theme song made for Claire Need. And he kind of pushed me to like, no, do it yourself, Sean. You need the you need to <laughs> push your own chops together. <laughs> and I'm actually really happy with the little clip I made. So thank you, Michael. for. <laughs> so welcome back. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much. So it's good to be here. We were just talking that I think this is the fourth or fifth time. So yeah, you um, might have been. I'm back. not that special anymore. Actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was joking too before we come on because I know there's some people tuning in live. We've got three here now. Probably some more coming. Um, but the past couple times I interviewed Michael, I was just awash in listener questions. So I was joking that maybe one time I'll get to interview him <laughs> on the show instead of all the, the listeners. But uh, no, that is the point. I love when people, you know, send in their questions and tune in live and ask their questions and all that kind of stuff. So for those who are tuning in live, just a quick note, we're probably going to talk for, I don't know, half an hour or so. And then I will open up the floor if you do have any questions. I imagine there will be some questions. Um, so we'll try and see how many we can get through and uh, before kind of we hit the hour mark and sort of go from there. So yeah, this is awesome. So, Michael, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show today was I got inspired a while ago. Uh, a guy came on named Tommaso Longquich, not a guy, a great clarinet player. <laughs> um, but he, over the pandemic, ended up also getting a degree in, I believe, um, psychology. And he became like a, a, a psychoanalyst, um, as well as his performing degree, or sorry, his performing career. And it got me thinking, like, what other clarinetists are out there doing entrepreneurial things so i want this to be the first kind of in an informal series of like super entrepreneurial clarinetists who are doing cool stuff and um michael you're probably one of the the most successful i mean you went from last time we talked i think selling t-shirts on your website and some music scores <laughs> to being like an international you know recognized dealer of of all sorts of instruments and uh, upcoming soon too like you're going to be one of the first i think to be selling this new bakun bass clarinet like so walk me through kind of the journey from selling t-shirts to selling <laughs> all sorts of stuff and being a leader in the industry really actually the first thing that i sold was this uh, was the were these teeth cushions um, mm. my my dad actually um when i first started using them in high school my dad's like you should package those up and you should sell those <laughs> and i was like dad and um you know, uh, that literally was the first thing that we sold were these sort of strips of this teeth cushion that we use, this paraffin wax. And and now that is by far the most popular thing. And every time I have to cut 12 feet of that stuff, I'm like, all right, dad, shut up. You know, because <laughs> because I mean, that was that was actually the start of it. Um, you know, CDs, too, of course. But at any rate, um, you know, I uh, it was covid like a lot of things changed um, sort of perspective and. Uh, it allowed me to get the perspective um, when when a lot of folks were um, reaching out to me and saying, hey, you know, now I have an extra two hours in my day because I'm not commuting and I want to go back to playing the bass clarinet like I did in high school. And I'm 48 years old and I'm 31 years old. And what do I do and where do I get one? And I was sort of sending folks out and sort of brokering relationships with Dave Kessler and other places. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, you know, people are coming to me for this. And uh, while I know everybody, you know, can get a bass clarinet anywhere, a lot of the times they couldn't find more than just one to try. And so uh, at the time, my wife and I uh, had an Airbnb that clearly wasn't doing anything because COVID. Uh, and, and so what we wound up doing was selling the Airbnb and uh, that netted us enough uh, from the sale of the house to buy a ton of bass clarinets. And there we started. So we started selling bass clarinets back in 2000, uh, 2021. And with the goal of having 
every bass clarinet uh, in stock that people would want to try, at least the ones that I thought were any good. And, and I am, I am curating, right? I mean, that's part of the, sh the what I do. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, in, in this spring, uh, I was convinced to start adding other clarinets. So now, um, you know, harder to find clarinets like C clarinets and E flat clarinets, and we sell B flat clarinets too. Um, and, uh, of course, but, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we're just trying to, we're trying to build this shop out to the degree where I can actually leave my day job, which we may talk about, um, at Amazon, which in, on January 3rd, I am, I am leaving the corporate world. I am leaving advertising after 27 years in advertising, working for the man. And, uh, and I am going to focus entirely on ear spasm and all that that entails as a small business owner. So that's the full story. Maybe been more than you wanted, but that's the full story. That's perfect. No, congratulations. That's amazing. So it must really be taking off then. And it, is it a world first pretty much like as a base clarinet centric business like that? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I, I haven't seen any others. It's pretty niche. Um, I feel like you would know of all people. <laughs> I feel like I might, but I know, I mean, there are a lot of people who sell a lot of bass clarinets, you know, yeah. so there, there are other, uh, other stores, but uh, they are a clarinet slash bass clarinet shop and I'm a bass clarinet slash clarinet shop. So there's just, maybe it's all just in the, uh, in the emphasis. Well, it's so funny. I saw your post recently on Instagram, um, that letter that that little child, I don't know if it's a boy or girl sent into you. And, um, it's interesting because you have such reach in the clarinet world, like young kids like that are reaching out and, you know, older players, as you mentioned, and all those throughout their career. Um, I imagine though, that, that note meant a lot in some ways. What, what, what was that like getting that random note from a kid who's somehow following? Well, what I found out is actually, it's not a kid. Oh, um, it's actually a 24 year old young lady oh, uh, who okay. uh, is developmentally disabled. And oh, so I see. she she wrote that letter to me and I was, uh, I, you know, and I wrote her back, of course. And um, but I, I somebody else reached out saying that um, this was part of something as part of this therapy. And uh, mm. and so the speech therapy and communication therapy. And so her therapist reached out to me and gave me the context so I would know you know, you know, who this, who this person was. And I, I think it makes it all the more special to me, um, that, that, that I'm able to contribute to her development. Um, and yeah, so it's, it was, it was moving. It was moving like, and it became more the... moving as soon as I heard. Well, yeah. Yeah. So is it the music that she's listening to then that are, like your music? She's listening to my music. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's which, cool. which album then is it the, do you know which one? No, we we haven't gotten that far in our communication. <laughs> We're writing letters back and forth. <laughs> well, I remember when I emailed you back in like the day, um, I said something about the 10 children album, how I really liked it. And you surprised me. You said that not many people had really given feedback on it. And I was like, what? That's crazy. But oh, you mean, the, yeah, uh, the original well, 10 children back in the day, that was like mm -hmm. 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a different time and, and um, yeah. So, I mean, music yeah. is, I mean, we could talk about that. I mean, this whole idea of, being noticed in a world where everybody can i mean we all share shelf space with yeah. john mayer and taylor swift when we're on spotify if you want to think of it that way we're on the shelf along with them alphabetically or not and uh you know there's a nice democracy to that but but it's 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 really hard to get noticed you know especially you know when you're doing something niche totally yeah not to go on a huge tangent but sure. I, it's, I was just talking to about this to someone the other day, like one of the things that drives me nuts about Spotify and all these things is that they're so focused on discovering new music all the time, but it's never quite what you want. And like, I don't know about you, but I also am not into listening to music just for the mood. Like, I'm not like, I want to feel happy. So I'm going to put on happy songs. Like I want the music to sometimes tell me how to feel. I want to listen to an album and, and hear what the artist had to say, not just, <laughs> you know what I mean? So this whole idea of these curated, like, it's a Friday afternoon and I'm tired having a cup of coffee playlist is just kind of a weird notion to me, but Hey, I've never thought of it that way, but you're right. I, I've, yeah. I haven't thought about it as music serving. Yeah. I haven't thought of it that way. It's a very but background. Right. But that's what people want though. They want, I'm in the cafe studying. I want to relax and listen to music. I don't want to be jarred by an emotional piece that might make me think about <laughs> something else, you know? Yeah. I mean, there, I, I can't listen to certain types of music when I'm trying to concentrate. I totally you know but i can listen to other kinds of music when i'm trying to concentrate so <laughs> yeah exactly so let's dive a little more into the business then so we've gone all the way from 
mouth cushions, t-shirts, bass clarinets. What is next? What are you, what are you tackling now? Um, growth? Oh growth? gosh. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I, I am really, um, just trying to figure out how to grow. You know, there was this, there was this comment, I forget who it, who said it, but like, um, how big can you get before you get bad? And I don't really want to get big because I don't want to get bad, but I also don't want to get big because I'm not looking for, you know, world domination. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, it's a small business that me and my wife started and we run and it's very small. And, you know, I, it's maybe it's very uncapitalistic to think this way, but I'm, I am just interested in my goal with the business is to increase the number of people who enjoy the bass clarinet and the clarinet um in, increase their ability to enjoy it by getting them a good instrument and providing help as they choose it and help after they choose it uh and you know this all stems back to something i think we probably talked about a long time ago which was harry sparney who's just like you know the whole mantra that he drilled into me when i was studying with harry sparney in, in holland in 1989 a long time ago was that you know you we need to leave the bass clarinet in a safe place um and we need to continue to kind of grow i mean he really kind of started it in a lot of ways there were others before him and there are others after him but he, like he did his thing and to me you know um music is for a lifetime and the and it's not necessarily for a living and so you mm. know how do you get people to enjoy music for a lifetime and so that's the idea around providing the support i want to leave the bass clarinet in a better place than i found it um and i'm doing whatever i can to do that and this business is part of it i love that you know there's a local business owner i know too in calgary here and i got talking to him one time and he was saying something exactly the same because people ask him why don't you franchise? Why don't you have a, have a store wherever? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? He's like, but there's only one me. And part of the business is that personability and being able to connect directly with my customers. That's why they like me so much, <laughs> you know? So if I was to franchise this off to someone else in Toronto to set up a second store, it's not really the same business anymore. That's right. And I think that's one of the bigger in challenges is how can you how can you delegate maybe some of the things that you, that I, how do I delegate some of the things that I need to do that are not customer facing? Right. So, I mean, they, they come, people come because they want to talk to me or they want to talk to Catherine in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the part of it is that front facing part that I'm there for, but I don't necessarily, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have to do all my accounting. Though I should, yeah, <laughs> I do. But at a certain point, I need to figure out what things I can delegate so I can focus on the continue to focus on the things that are important because I enjoy every part of it. Actually, that's very true. Actually, there's a point where you have to figure out what stuff you can't do. And I got there with the podcast a long time ago, and and you know my editor Brian's been helping me for years, but it really wouldn't be possible without him because he takes all that stuff that that I kind of don't really have time to do or the energy and lets me kind of focus on this element of it. Um, and it's so important as part of like the ecosystem of the podcast, you know, so it's really, it's really good to find people you can work with that you want to work with too, I suppose, but, uh, or AI. Me, it, well, yeah, I mean, AI is a really good intern, um, but it's never <laughs> something that I would put in front of people. Um, but yeah. you know, I'm also a bit of a control freak. So I like, I still do all my editing for YouTube and all that stuff. There's, oh, really? you know, yeah, all of it. That's, that's a lot then you're doing so much. It's crazy. In fact, I, I, I love the, uh, the Batman I came up with, it was so funny. I just, I feel like you are kind of the Batman or maybe not Batman, but I mean, I think Batman cause you're a sleek black bass clarinet, you know, and all the kind of gadgets Batman uses or whatever. And you are in New York, right? So <laughs> I guess, yeah, I'm in Gotham city. You're sort of in the bat layer now and the bass layer. That's right. I'm in the bat you know? layer. You need like a bass clarinet bat logo or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could change the color of it. I think you know? that'd be perfect. This is, all, this is all our new space. Uh, since we renovated our basement to be the studio where we, uh, invite people to come try instruments so this is i hope it's called the basement no it's yeah. not because i'm oh, not it's... i'm not corny <laughs> <laughs> well i am mine would be called the basement <laughs> right, i call then. it the basement i call it the basement oh man that's great so speaking of bass let's let's also talk about this amazing sort of opportunity that you had to help design this new bass clarinet like that's what a, a misnomer what a, okay i i, I want to make sure that it's really clear that i did not help design the bass clarinet Helped um, work on, I, helped test. I was I was there with Maury as the first prototype came 
or he, you know, I was able to play the first prototype and I was able to provide some ergonomic feedback on some keys and, and you know, we worked together on, on voicing and, you know, and I worked with Joel on, you know, on some questions, Joel Jaffe, questions about, you know, the case and could we make it so that you could actually carry a bass clarinet stand on it and which bass clarinet stand should we make it able to carry and like I'm providing input and feedback, but in no way that I know of did I help design this instrument? I just, okay. I was, I was the beneficiary of a well-designed instrument that I could provide feedback on. Okay. I can appreciate that, but I feel like that's still helping design it. And I just wanted to be completely upfront. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, you know, the, the, the Maury take should take all of the credit because this is a guy that has been, um, uh, promising slash threatening a bass clarinet to the world for like 25 years and I've heard about it and, and I'm really glad I didn't hold my breath, but I am glad now that it is, it is nearly here and I am so excited for the world <laughs> and for Maury and for, you know, for me. And, and I think it's, um, it really, really is a tremendous instrument and it is the beginning, I think of a different generation. Um, you know, we've gone through this sort of transition where there have been other manufacturers making them and they are making good instruments. And when I say other, I mean, besides the big two French ones and, uh, you know, and, and maybe Yamaha don't really consider Yamaha in that, but at any rate, so now I think we're really, we're now at a, this is a new, um, peak. And I think that this is gonna, this is just what I, I know that Harry Sparnay would be really happy. I think about him a lot and I think about, you know, what has happened since he's been gone and where the bass clarinet is going and the renewed interest in it and the renewed development for it. I, I'm just so happy that we get another one soon. You say it's a new peak. I would say it's a new low. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, my God. You are so <laughs> corny. Jeez. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's the, it's dad jokes. It's the dad jokes. I can't stop them now. Right. <laughs> Uh, they'll stop them for you, your kids. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> so what can we, I don't know how much we can talk about it exactly, but like, what are some features or differences of this instrument that we can look forward to? Like I'm imagining the, the intonation is going to be just amazing. Yeah, that's a big thing of it. I mean, the bass clarinet and the clarinet are, I mean, it is just one big compromise, right? Uh, the twelfths and all of that and you know, how, uh, and, and the free blowing notes versus stuffy notes. I think a lot of bass clarinet players are familiar with that on some instruments where like, God, why is this stuffy? Well, it doesn't have to be. And uh, so I, I think the one thing that Maury said that I really agree with is, um, is that a lot of bass clarinets, as you play up a scale, chromatic scale from the low C all the way up as high as you can go, go through several different personalities in terms of like, there's this section of the bass clarinet that sounds really woody, and here's this section that sounds kind of stuffy, and here's this section that feels like it's just a little bit bright. And, um, and this is an instrument that actually sounds like one instrument all the way up and down, but is flexible enough to sound like different ones depending on how you approach it. So it's very, very even. It's even, of course, it's, you know, every instrument's going to have notes that are this and that. Nobody makes a perfectly in tune bass clarinet, not even Maury. Um, then some of the other, there's some other really thoughtful um, parts to the, to the instrument that we've been talking about. Uh, and I think, you know, they're going to, those are going to continue to be developed as Maury looks toward the high end um, of, of the, the range. Um, but what I, I think is really the, the easiest thing to say is, is, is terrific and outstanding compared to whatever else is out there is it, the evenness of its scale, both intonation and, but timbre, um, and how amazingly easy it is to play. Um, it, uh, it is just, uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, the high clarion register G, A, B, C, you know, how does that note squeak? How can, I mean, how does it not squeak? How does it not grunt? You know, these, the instrument just kind of plays. And so it's, it's, it's a great, great instrument for people who are, have already kind of mastered it or on the way to mastering it. It's also a good instrument for people who are like, I don't know, I want to buy my first bass clarinet because yeah, it's expensive, but it is not as expensive. I mean, you could get two of them for the price of some of, you know, like a Tosca. So, uh, you know, I, I think it is, it's, it's really well positioned and I'm, um, you know, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited to see what other parts of it, the input that I've provided are going to able to make it into this instrument. I obviously play a lot of 
um, of electronic music and therefore need a place to clip microphones. And so the, 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 you know, it's a struggle to find a way to clip a microphone and run some cable so they don't like close in one of your pads on the, you know, like a low, low C, C sharp or something. So it, you know, how can we, how can we make an instrument that has some of these thoughtful touches for people who, who, who do play a lot of amplified music and, and bass clarinets are being used a lot in that kind of an environment, new music that's amplified. So stuff like that. There's just a lot of thoughtful thinking. And, and I got to say, um, you know, one of the heroes over there is, is Maury's son. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, an engineer like I have never seen. Jeremy's just like he's doing some great work. It's such a family uh, affair over there. Mary and Maury and Jeremy and everybody. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the things I really love about the Bakun instruments too is I remember when I first started there, I was like, this is almost like the apple of the clarinet world. Like they want to solve these little problems that uh, to me, a lot of other manufacturers were not interested in solving. And I was like, but why not? <laughs> you know, and uh, I've really enjoyed playing the, the Coca Bola wood, which I wanted to ask you about, actually. Um, I don't know if it's the first bass to be produced in Coca Bola, but probably one of the first kind of mass market in that price range, I would think. Um, maybe uh, not. There's some I mean, other you're ones adding now, a but... lot of, yes, it is the first mass market, if you want to call it mass market, <laughs> bass clarinet in that price range that is Coca Bola. Sure. It with Bakun stamped on it. <laughs> yeah, with Bakun stamped on it that's called the Q-Series. Yep, 100%. You're right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I, what I, what uh, a great question. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are other there are other bass clarinets uh, yeah. that, that are made of Coca Bowl. I own one. Uh, it's made yeah. by Ubel. Um, okay. And so there, there are other, and, you know, they... Uh, Ubel makes um, a Pawnee bass clarinet that I think is terrific. Uh, I like it so much that I don't actually carry the Grenadilla one anymore. Um, because I think the Mopani one is just slightly more expensive and like eon tons better than it. So I'm like, I I'm going to focus on that one again. That's just like decisions that we make as, as retailers about what we want to, you know, carry and how, how much of it and that sort of thing. I guess my question was really about the playability and the tone quality, but also the care and maintenance, because for me, I, I found I really love the, the Coca Bolo. First of all, it just looks amazing. But second, it, did, it gives me a bit of a kind of a more vocal kind of sound, I would say, warmer maybe. Um, I know it's a little bit subjective, but what's your interpretation of the two woods? I've on only the played the Coca Bolo okay. one because that's all that has been available to me to play. So I have nothing to compare it to. How did it feel, though? I think people want to know, like, what did the. How did it feel? It felt fantastic. I mean, I have rich. a little. I have a clip of it on my website where you can, you know, order it if you want. Um, and oh, and that's live now. Yeah, it is. You can. Okay, last time I was we, there, it wasn't there. Okay. No, nope, it's there. Yes. Um, and uh, and already, a lot of people have ordered it sight unseen. And uh, but there's a little recording of me playing, um, and it is, you know, it's just, it's a free blowing, beautiful, very lyrical, lots of high mid partials that I like, that which gives you ring. Um, it's you know a lot of bass clarinets have a scooped mid. If you want to think of it in terms of an equalizer, the 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 middle the middle range of it can kind of get a little bit dead. Uh, and this has a lot of ring to it. It also has a lot in the upper mids, so like around seven thousand, eight thousand hertz, which gives it a lot of presence, which allows it to carry. Um, it's got a really nice, solid fundamental. Most bass clarinets do, but it's the it's it is the uh, it, it it's all of the fundamentals above. I'm sorry, it's all of the uh, uh, um, gosh, all the frequencies above the fundamental that in, you know, that really give the instrument its character and it's a shape and uh, um, it's literally a shape when you're looking at it um, on, on a scope. And it's the, it's a shape that I really appreciate. It's, it's a beautiful uh, sounding instrument. For the Coco Bullet Wood, do you find in your years now of retailing different woods, do you find that it is more prone to cracking? Because I always hear this from people like, oh, be careful with the Coco Bolo. But you know what? I've played my Coco Bolo instrument now for six years, I think. And my previous one, three years before that, I never had any issues. I just take care of my stuff. I mean, I feel. <laughs> I don't think it's about that. I think, you know, in my experience, and, uh, and this is my experience as a retailer of the instruments that I have, I would say 20% of instruments crack. They crack if they are, it doesn't matter the make, uh, it doesn't matter how expensive it is. Every instrument, every one of them that I've sold, um, uh, bass clarinet has, well, except for Ubel, uh, has cracked. And so if an instrument cracks, it cracks. 
But the thing I want to say is like, um, it's really important what happens after it cracks. Do you have to order the inst you have to order the new joint and wait nine months for it to show up? And meanwhile, play with a pinned instrument or play with a glued instrument. I mean, it's it's really important that the company that stands behind the instrument warranty is able to provide you a solution quickly. And yeah. and so, you know, uh, to me, crack happens. Cracks. Well, that cracks <laughs> happen. And um, and uh, it, it really is important that it's there's a company behind it that's able to say, yep, got it. Here's what we recommend. If you want to replace it, replace it. If you want to pin it, here's somebody to pin it for you. And here's a solution for you quickly because nobody wants to wait. Yeah. No, I think it's a lot to do with the maintenance too. I mean, the one instrument that I did crack in university, I stupidly was like walking outside with it between concert venues. Oh, I'll just tuck it in my coat. I won't put it away. I'm too lazy today. And bam, it blew up basically. And I was like, well, that's on me. You know, <laughs> that's minus 30, right? What was I thinking? Not much apparently, but um, it depends. I think, you know, the climate, the humidification. I actually wanted to ask you about this because um, you are stating on your website to use a slightly higher humidification pack than most people would advise, including Bovida, who I just had on the podcast last week. Um, but your justification is fairly sound. So can you go into that a little bit? Why you're using the more humid pack than? Well, okay, unless you're using a low max humidipro case, um, your case is not airtight or, or humidity controlled that way. And, uh, and so, you know, you're going to lose humidity through the zipper. I mean, like, it, it, you know, so, so having something to, that I've noticed, you know, slightly higher then once, you know, if you stick it, if you stick a hygrometer inside, you'll notice that the inside does not match your, your Boveda. Your Boveda might say, I, I, I use a 59 or a 58, uh, but you know, it, it registers 48 in the case, which is where I want it to be. And I think it would be ideal, maybe if the case stays closed 100% of the time, but you're also opening it to practice, hopefully, <laughs> and play. And so you're letting out some of the humidity too. So yeah, that made sense to me to kind of go for the 58 or the 62 if you want your target to be 49. Yeah, and it also depends on how big your Boveda is. Um, you know, the instruments here in the shop, I keep them in humidors that are set mm -hmm. at 50%. And uh, and then when they go out, you know, I I put in a big big ass boveda not one of the not one of the 58s that you see that are like this big i'm talking about like a 62 that's the size of kentucky and yeah. uh and i know that's overkill but these are big instruments with big cases and i don't know how far they're going to travel and i just you know it's a small price to pay for that security that i feel totally yeah i recently learned that those are recyclable did you know that uh, i know they're just life? salt and water yeah some kind of proprietary mix with a permeable membrane or something and then you can just recycle just drink it just just no. it right up <laughs> yeah the, the guy made a joke about that actually on the episode and i was like i don't know if we should be saying that to people because <laughs> someone's gonna like mix a martini with it or something you know you never know out there but that's an interesting thought <laughs> bathing but, uh, yeah yeah bathing it's like a bath bath salt or bath something salt. when you're done with it <laughs> maybe i don't know but yeah i've been using those things for years and it's just so interesting because it's it's one of those advancements that's just so much better than what was out before? I mean, for me, I remember in university, again, using like orange peels or those little damp things that would spill everywhere and ruin your pads. And this is yep. just so much better for, for wood, wood wind and wood string players, I guess. But well, let's open. It's almost 1130. So I feel like we've had a great chat here about your, your business and the, the bass clarinet. Is there something else you wanted to add or wanted me to ask before we open up the floor to the wonderful guests who are tuning well, in today? Well, if there's anybody who has questions, we, we can do that. Otherwise, we can continue to talk if anybody, you know. Who yeah, knows? Let's if, Maury's in the, if Maury's here, he'll talk the rest of the time. So let's see if he has <laughs> I think Maury's here. I think a few people are here. Uh, seven, uh, it says seven are here now. So let's open up the floor. If you want to chat your question, there's a little chat box. You can click that and then answer, uh, type your question, and we'll try to answer it. Or if you're using Chrome, uh, you should be able to like raise your hand, and then I can invite you to actually go on video. So if you'd like to try that, you can go ahead and do that in the chat or by clicking that little button. And uh, otherwise, Michael and I will just keep going here. <laughs> so, so one question I had for you, Michael, while we kind of wait for that to come up is, how are you doing with the whole multitasking? Because I'm also a very busy guy, you know, I'm 
I'm working on the podcast. I got another podcast. I'm working with Bakun. I'm, you know, I was doing some music clinics and things, which I'm not doing this year, taking a break from that, but I've also got the kids and we got cats. I don't know why I did that, but, but (laughs) there's just so much going on, you know, and you'd like to have some downtime in your life too. So how do you manage or do you have any tips for kind of managing your incredibly busy or is that Um, just how you function? Well, I mean, let's think about all the things I have to juggle. I have to juggle Amazon still. Uh, I, I too am, you know, I have my own business. I have to write music. I have to make videos. I have to edit videos. I have to, you know, take photographs of things for the website. I have to take care of my dog. I have to take care of myself. Um, you know, uh, and it is, it, everything is prioritization. Um, and so I, I, and I, I have, I have a touch of ADD. So I, you know, I, I use that as a superpower in a sense where I am, I'm able to work really quickly on certain parts of it. I can get something 90% of the way, uh, really fast. So, um, you know, and so I can bring a lot of things up to the place where then, you know, I need to focus and, and sort of finish them so that they get all the way to a hundred percent. But, uh, my wife, Catherine, um, who who's just such a tremendous partner to me uh is understands how my brain works and so she and i will sit and we will just sort of create checklists of things that i need to do either today or tomorrow or next week or whatever and i'm able to sort of then i don't that the add part of me doesn't forget stuff so i i you know that's how i tend to to organize my day as sort of looking at this list of things that are outstanding to do and the ones that we may have added in the day, last day or so and just sort of tackle them and you know i uh, don't watch a lot of television <laughs> i don't play a lot of video games it's a lot of work um but but it is really just about priority the things that do suffer are my practice is my practicing i don't really get to practice as much as i'd like um I certainly I don't perform very often anymore uh, outside of YouTube, though that is what's going to get replaced when I leave it. When I leave Amazon, I'm going to be able to travel a lot more. And I've already booked several little tours for 2024, which I'm very excited I get to do again. That'd be very cool. Do you have you're a fairly technologically savvy guy. Like, are you using a certain app for this to do list or just old fashioned? Uh, It is literally analog as a notebook (laughs) that we write in. You know, if you're interested, there's an app I use because I'm the same way. I get so scattered and I can be like starting one thing and starting four other things at the same time. And like I realized one time that I just unfortunately I'm not good at multitasking. I'm good at many tasking, I guess, but not mul- not at the same time. So I have to like this 30 minutes I'm doing X, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and but there's an app called Todoist that I use. And I love it because it actually populates your day for you. You can have like multiple lists like this is my you know personal list or work list or clarinet list or whatever. But if, if you put due dates and everything in the morning, it just gives you, it aggregates your to-do list for the day. and just gives you the stuff you've got to do. And I'm like, wow, this is so good. Um, and it's, I don't know, I find it really, really helpful. So if you're interested, check it out. Yeah, I, I like the I like the analog thing for that. I do so much <laughs> digital stuff that it's, it's yeah. kind of nice to take a pen and draw a line through something. That's true. It's sometimes it's, it seems like everything's an app these days. And sometimes I wish we could go back to, a few separate devices for some things like you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Step back 20 years and get yourself an old iPod again or whatever. Oh my gosh. How are you doing that then? Cause you say you can do that. So you just grab your notebook and stay off your phone. Then when you're trying to work. Yep. Uh, I, I take my phone and I put it on focus and my computer on focus and I focus. Uh, and, <laughs> and you know, uh, I am, you know, I don't get everything done, but I, I get a lot of things done. And, you know, and I'm and I forgive myself for the things that I don't get to finish. That's important, I think. Mm-hmm. That's really important. Funny enough, there's an app for that, too. A friend was telling me if you want to focus on not, and not use your phone, there's some app called Forest where you like plant trees or something and they grow in the downtime where you're not using your phone. And I'm like, I don't think using an app to not use my phone makes sense to me <laughs> look i mean there's so many different everybody is neurodivergent in their own yeah. way and ev- that's yeah. why there i think there's so many different apps to do this stuff so that people have an opportunity to find the thing that's right for them right to kind of help you out with that mm-hmm. so oh a question has come in here from none other than mori bakun himself how do you suggest people test new instruments to make good decisions and not get overwhelmed that's a great question yeah it is uh i 
have my way. Um, and, and I have the way that I help people when they come to the studio. So generally speaking, let's just say that money is not an object. Okay. And you have therefore eight or nine different types of bass clarinets, brands, models of bass clarinets that you can try. And that's, that's overwhelming. That's overwhelming for anybody. So you're staring down and this works for clarinets and bass clarinets and anything, harmonicas. And, uh, my, what I suggest people do don't pay any attention to the instrument you're playing, what its brand is. Don't pay attention. Don't let anything sort of distract you from playing the instrument and just play. Get your gut instinct. How easy is it for you to sound like you? Because you're going to sound like you no matter which of these instruments you play. I'm going to sound like me on them and you're going to sound like you on them and they're going to sound like them on them. And that's how it works is that you sound eventually you will sound like you. It may not be immediate. It may feel weird under your fingers because keys may feel differently, but ultimately within a week, you're going to be sounding like you on any instrument, basically, certainly any new instrument that seals properly. You're going to be able to make it sound like you. So your gut is going to be able to tell you a lot about how well this instrument lets you do that easily. And I think that's the biggest thing is how hard is it for you to sound like you want to sound? And so that is what I ask people to do is just play, 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 and just play through them all and immediately put some aside that are not right for you, that, that feel weird. Um, and then they do that. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just sitting there handing instruments to them, handing instruments to them. And, you know, then they'll get a, usually get a couple that they really like, probably no more than three. And at that point, um, I let them play. You know, they can they can sit down here in the studio and um, and they can play, you know, for an hour if that's what they want to do. It's one one at a time here at Earspasm. And um, so that's how I do it as well. I, I you know, if you want, you can write down some notes about the instrument. Does this does this feel weird? Does this feel stuffy? Does that feel funky? Does this key feel too high? Is that spring too tight? Be able to write those things. Those are all things that can get changed. Um, and, but generally, it's the feel is the feel is the feel. At that point, once they ask me to come back, um, I I have blindfolds. <laughs> I I literally have blindfolds that I had printed up. They were at Clarinet Fest. They say, "Shh, I'm concentrating," and um, they're there. It's theirs to keep. And um, so anyway, they put them on, and I start handing them instruments, and they play them without knowing what I'm handing them. And invariably, I will play. I will give them the two or three that they like, but I will pull in some other ones that I think are similar to those two or three that they may not have gotten a good impression of at the beginning. And so I'll I'll probably expand it to four or five. I will also include their instrument in it if they brought one. So that way they're able to see. And in some cases, somebody like I love this instrument. Like this is great because it's free because it's yours. And so like, there's some people who walk out having not bought an instrument, but feeling more comfortable with the one they have. That's great. That's fine. Um, but at any rate, there are a lot of surprises in that last blindfold moment where, where they're able to sort of say, wow, I, I didn't think I'd like a firebird or I didn't think that I'd like an Uble. And some people are like, oh, yeah, I could tell this was the Tosca and this is the one I want. And they walk off with it. And that's, you know, and that's totally fine. So I, I feel like, but ultimately, and this is the answer to the question, is more times than not, it's the first instrument they liked at the very beginning is the one that they go home with. Because your gut says so much. Really? So like, even if it's, you mean people just generally lean towards the right one intuitively? Mm -hmm. That's, That's what I find. That's what I find. Uh, there have been times when uh, that's not the case. Um, there was a fellow who was really, really interested in buying an R13. And he told me why he liked the R13. And we did the blindfold thing. And I put together an instrument that cost less than half of that R13, which was a, a, a Royal Classical Limited. Um, R13 is like 4,500. This thing was like $2,100. And he was just like, this is fantastic. And I'm like, take off your blindfold. And it's this instrument. He's like, you know, holy crap, this is amazing. And I'm like, the instrument chose you. It's just like yeah. Harry Potter. <laughs> I want to kind of spin Maury's question around a little bit. What do you suggest people not do when they're testing? 
anything specific? Like, I mean, I, I've seen the whole clarinet fest thing where people play like a 40 octave scale at, at, as fast as they can. And <laughs> I'm not well, sure. Well, I don't know how best. useful, but I, frankly, I don't think how you, I don't think trying to buy a clarinet at clarinet fest is the wisest move. Personally. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I discourage people from doing that at clarinet fest, even though I'm trying to sell instruments at clarinet fest. Um, anyway, um, I think everybody's really different. It depends on your level, right? So I've had folks come in who've never played bass clarinet before, really ever. And that whole process is so different than someone who is a professional. And they're here to try twelfths. And they're here to sort of, you know, you know, they know what they're looking for. So it really varies. But if if somebody who's never really played a lot of a lot of music has this list that someone gave them that says, make sure the twelfths are in tune but they don't even have a mouthpiece they can play like that. Then those folks, I would be like, please don't get so granular so quickly. You're not in a place where granularity is going to help you make a decision. So I think that the best thing though, to do is um, first of all, don't overwhelm yourself. Oh, don't overwhelm yourself with choice for the whole time. And second of all, don't make a decision if you're not ready to make a decision. A lot of people, probably at least a third of people, I'm like, I think you should just go. And, um, and, you know, take a walk around the block or go home and come back next week. And, you know, and that, that perspective will allow them because your brain gets tired, your brain gets tired. And so, uh, and I start to recognize that. And I'm like, I think, I mean, unless they're traveling and a lot of people do travel from all over the world to New York to come and pick out an instrument and that may not be possible, then they maybe a walk around the block is better for them. But I, I do, I do the opposite of hard sell. Um, I do hard not sell, uh, because I, you know, I, I want to make sure that they feel like they're in control of the situation. Well, it's smart. Cause it's not really a such thing as sales. People always sell themselves on something. That's what they say. You know? That's what they yeah, say. That's what they say. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that, you know, giving people a comfortable experience that they're making the right purchase decision is more important than selling them a bass clarinet. It's like inception. You got to plant the seed and think they put it there. You know? No, I don't, I don't, I don't play games like that. Uh, and I don't know if, no. and I think you're not serious, but I mean, it's really no, being... important. It, it's really important yeah. that people feel like they have the agency to say no. It's really important that people feel like they're comfortable being able to make a purchase decision. That's what I write all of this stuff on my website is because people are, people are clicking buy on a $17,000 instrument that they have not played. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and part of what I learned at Amazon that I carry is how do you make somebody feel comfortable making a decision on a purchase that they usually do in person? So wait, this actually adds an interesting element to this question. So you're talking a lot about people coming to you, trying at your location, they got six or eight to try from. What is the experience from you like different when you're kind of shopping online like that? And what would you advise for people who are doing it remotely across the country and they can only try one or two? Um, write me. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I sell more instruments after having long email exchanges. Okay. Uh, with Just people. really getting and, a feel for the person and what they're yeah, wanting. Yeah. And, and get a yeah, sense yeah. of what they want and, you know, I mean, there are people, there are people who click buy that I've never heard from and they are buying expensive ass bass clarinets and, uh, you know, awesome. Um, but I think the ones that are happy are the ones that, that are able to sort of have consulting. I think that's one of the things that, yeah, yeah. that, that a small business like mine can do. Totally. We've had another question come in here. Um, this is from Brian Chappelle, who's Clarinet's editors. So thank you, Brian. But also, I think you just might have met him in in Seattle a few weeks ago at the uh, I can't remember what that event is called, but there was one out there. Um, he says, "Hi, Michael. A question to add to the queue. I'd love to hear about any memorable performance stories you have, whether it's live electronics, going haywire, or just a specific <laughs> artist you've played with <laughs> that you admire a lot. What are some of your most memorable performances in your career? That's a good question." Sure. I mean, some of them are memorable. Some of them are memorable for good reasons. Um, I toured with the Klezmatics for years um, back in the late 90s. The Klezmatics is a very well-known, very popular Grammy winning klezmer band. And I and, um, you know, uh, David Krakauer was their front man for a long time and he left pretty abruptly and they called me and they're like, do you play klezmer? And I said, yeah. And, and then, and, um, and I hadn't, 
Um, but I went to Dave Krakauer and I was like, Hey, I just did something stupid. And, uh, he, you know, he taught me all the tunes and everything. Anyway, so Klezmatics, we went to Italy and, uh, we, I, we were playing in Verona in the middle of a square. It's the same square where like the, the, um, Romeo and Juliet balcony is like the famous Romeo and Juliet balcony. And I'm standing there. And so we're in the middle of a, like streets are coming out, like straight out from this square in every direction. And I'm fronting the band because I play the clarinet. And there I could not see the end of people at any street. Um, there there had to have been 50, 60,000 people there um, having the best time because klezmer music is so joyous. That probably is the most memorable experience that I've had uh, performing ever. Um, and I've had some, you know, I've had issues, you know, bad things that I don't dwell on. Like, you know, my instrument, is, a screw fell out on a live radio show. And, um, like, it was part of an ensemble and I had to walk off stage and figure out what was wrong. Uh, I've had my neck break in concerts where, uh, actually, I remember that happened. And um, <laughs> of all people, Gregory Barrett was in, the, was in the audience and he, like, runs up on stage. He's like, I have one for you. And I was able to finish the concert. So things like, you know, stories from the road like that, you know, where your gear falls apart or my, none of my gear showed up because it was, you know, I was going to Florida State and all of the bats from the Florida State baseball team had to get on the plane and it was too heavy for my stuff. You know, like, so stuff like that all the time, sleeping in airports, stuff like that. But the most memorable ones are these, uh, you know, like that one. And then, you know, playing, I remember playing with Steve Gadd, who was my favorite drummer of all time. Uh, it was part of New Jersey Symphony and it was, uh, I think it was Art Garfunkel was in the front. Uh, but his band, including Steve Gadd was, was back there. And I, uh, I was sitting right next to Steve Gadd. I, I could barely play. That's really cool. That's so, really cool. Yeah. Have you considered that that, that audience size of the 50,000, 60,000 people, as exciting as that was, like that's about your YouTube audience size now <laughs> no, too. No, it's not. <laughs> no? How, how many people do you have on YouTube now? Isn't it I don't know. 50, I mean, but it's, it's rarely that many people. But it is an interesting point that you're making, which is... Let me and, check. Let me check. Well, <laughs> I, I, uh, it is a totally different world in 1997, uh, 57,000, okay. 57,000 on there now. Yeah. But they're not all in one place, one place at one time, but that's I, true. That's yeah. true. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I just try to were. try to make stuff that people find interesting. It's, you know, uh, and, how, and doing it now in my 14th year, um, is, you know, I look at the old videos and I am not this gray and I don't, and I have more hair and, um, I, it, it's, it's interesting to try and stay relevant when people that I meet at, at shows are like, I used to watch you in middle school and now I have two kids, my <laughs> own. And I'm like, that makes me feel really old. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I had the same thing happen to me at the, the couple of clarinet fests I went to. People were like, you know, their kids had come out because they listened to the podcast or whatever. But now I've watched those people, some of them, like get their degree and get their yeah. masters and get some job in a symphony somewhere. And I'm like, oh, man, it's been a while now. Like I've been making this for, what, eight years? And uh, yeah, that's two full, you know, degree periods at a school, basically. So, yeah. So now, it, now it's time for you to start getting gray hair, man. Exactly. Well, I'm not going to get that. Mine's just going to, mine's just going to go away. <laughs> Gray hair is the dream at this point. Mm. Hair at all. Another question has come in from Maury. Um, do you suggest recording the final choices of instrument and listening after? Yeah. Yeah. After yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes. And I have a setup in the studio here that does just that. So I have some high end recording equipment. I have good speakers so that they're able to, so they're not doing it on their phone, you know? Uh, and so they can listen and, you know, I'm able to add if they want a hall sound so, you know, uh, so that they have a chance to hear what they sound like in different environments and dry and all of that other stuff. So, yeah, I totally I do recommend that for a lot of people. Not everybody feels like doing that. Some people are a little shy. It's such an amazing thing, though. I mean, I think it's so valuable that the, the whole service you're providing is really interesting and, and valuable. But also, I think it's kind of really special because it's focused in on an instrument, which and your expertise, I mean, it'd be hard to find that at just any kind of average music store. You're you know? damn right. Oh, you're really. You're <laughs> re <laughs> yeah. How often do you get to go try bass clarinets with Batman himself? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry, hold on. Are you still hold on? It's the bat phone. Still... <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> the base phone. Are you still like flying in your plane and stuff? All yeah, that? yeah. Actually, the yeah. plane, the plane, ear spasm now owns the plane. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I I use the plane <laughs> to uh, pick up and drop off instruments from uh, the techs that work on it, like Miles De Castro. I will. It is a seven-hour drive through the mountains, or it's a two-hour flight. So I will, you know, my my plane can can hold six bass clarinets comfortably. Um, without falling out of the sky. So I will fly there and back. That's just wild. That's totally crazy. <laughs> it's what a, else do you do? Great excuse. Like, we, I don't imagine you have a lot of, like, downtime, but, like, what other hobbies outside of music or bass clarinet do you have? Are there... Um, I do like playing <laughs> I do like playing video games occasionally. Oh, okay. Uh, no, but I um, I like to cook and I like to bike, but uh, I, I am actually kind of a hermit, interestingly. Okay. Uh, you know, um, I, I just like just being quiet at home. <laughs> I mean, my, my day is so busy that my hobby is not working. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I, I enjoy. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. That's yeah. so funny. I remember one time I was, when I was teaching a lot, um, cause I used to listen to a lot of music in university, like all day long. If I, if I wasn't playing music, I was listening to it or thinking about it or whatever. And one day I drove home from a workshop and I just chose to sit in silence. And I was like, have I been ruined as a, <laughs> as a musician? Like it's a, I'm, I'm, I, I've had so much sound today. Like I just can't take another iota of noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? My wife is very much that way. Yeah. 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 When it got there, it was kind of a sad moment though. Like this, I, I would, my, my choice listening right now is absolutely nothing, you know, by choice. You gotta, I mean, you gotta yeah. clear, you gotta clear the palate. What's a recipe? What's your favorite recipe? Oh gosh, uh, I, I am very much a cookbook cook, so okay. uh, you know there are only a couple of recipes that I can that I can do without a cookbook, um, but mostly Italian stuff. I think we need like a a base clarinet, a base clarinetist guide to your cooking or something. No, I think that you want no <laughs> Chuck Curry's base clarinet guide to cooking. That's, you that's want right. Any, yeah. Chuck Curry is the man. And he might even be in the chat right now. Yeah. I think he is actually. Oh, there's a question from David before we go. I'm curious about your music listening habits. What are you listening to these days? Given you're interested in electronics, have you listened to much Bonnie Bear? Ooh, I've listened to lots of Bonnie Bear. I don't listen to a lot of Bonnie Bear. Um, I do listen to a lot of. Let's see, what am I listening to a lot of now? Um, I love Japanese house. The Japanese house um, is it's it's not that's not a style. That's actually the name of a group. Um, and um, and I am listening to a lot of Lewis Cole, who I think is brilliant. Um, I love Kiefer, which is this down tempo kind of stuff. Um, it's jazz. So I'm really interested in people who, who are, uh, who are doing jazz, but in, um, in an electronica style, but still have like the structure and I guess the rigor of jazz. And it's not just sort of jazzy, but it's actual jazz. So that's why, I mean, like if you haven't heard Lewis Cole or maybe it's Louis Cole, um, that that's a guy, Corey Wong, guitar player. Like those are the folks that really, really inspire me. Um, I'm going to do, a, actually one of the next videos that I do of this new series, which is, uh, tunes that don't have a bass clarinet, but need one, uh, is going to be me playing along. <laughs> I wrote a, I wrote a whole bass clarinet part on top of this Lewis Cole and, uh, um, Corey Wong tune. I just saw that video come out. I, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm excited to, cause that's such a great, great one. Do you oh, have Lawrence. any, yeah, that's a different one. It was Lawrence, another great band. Do you have any of kind of your favorite examples of the bass clarinet being used in, in more kind of like pop music? I mean, I mean, they're just not that many. I think the best, the, the one that I think of a band that I like a lot. I mean, we all know the Beatles used it and blah, blah, blah. But one of the, one of the principles of a band named meet beat manifesto, which is Jack dangers, whom I've never met plays a little bass clarinet in his crazy electronica stuff he sounds like he's never really studied the bass clarinet um but he's he is there wailing on it as best he can so i'm a big i'm a big fan of of his music the bass clarinet part of it is whatever i just think it's kind of cool that he uses it have you ever heard of bonobo uh, he's got a bass clarinet and no i was surprised when they toured here i saw them a couple of years ago um b-o-n-o-b-o -O -B yeah, a guy playing bass clarinet on stage as part of the band. He would go back between saxophone and that, but it was pretty cool. Huh. I thought that was kind of neat. There's another one, a uh, band called Peace Orchestra years ago. 
There's a few of their songs that have a really kind of cool bass clarinet riff that starts it off. You should and, put uh, this stuff in the in the yeah, show notes. Yeah, yeah, because I will. Yeah, I'll try and find. It. I've got a few uh, that are interesting over the years, but also the Talk Talk albums. You ever check those out? Oh God, yeah, I used to listen to Talk yeah. Talk in, in the okay, 80s. yeah, yeah. Yeah, some good bass clarinet on there. I was surprised really? one time I was watching Radiohead, as I used to watch, obviously, all, all the time. But they did a live performance of a song on, I think it was, like, Stephen Colbert or something. There was a guy playing contrabass on one of the songs. I was like, what am I seeing? I tried to figure out who that was, but I never never really could. But totally random. But anyway, well, thanks, everyone. This was some great questions. I loved how some of them were a little bit, you know, different and about different stuff. Um, David, I wanted to ask, was there bass clarinet on a Bonnie Vare album that I forgot? I I don't seem to recall any, but maybe there was. I know there is on the new Bjork album um, that's as right. well, actually. That's right. Yeah. That's, right. That's, a, that's the big one right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, Do you have advice for the people like me who haven't played a lot of bass clarinet? And this Bakun instrument is kind of pushing them to try it, not for the first time, but like to get into it and actually get one and start playing. Like Advice for those transitioning from B-flat to bass. Uh, well, I say that to, regardless of which instrument you choose, um, you don't want your bass clarinet to feel like your clarinet. It's not going to feel like your clarinet. Uh, the angle isn't going to be the same as your clarinet. The resistance isn't going to be the same as your clarinet. So don't try. Don't try to make it as resistant. Don't try to make that angle the same because it's just not going to be easy for you. Just approach it as a totally different instrument, um, and you will be a lot happier. So sort of put your mind back in sixth grade or whatever year it was that you started the clarinet <laughs> and, and really try to, try to develop a different um, – uh, a different relationship because it is such a different instrument. I love that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to all for tuning in. Thank you, especially to Michael for, for coming here today and chatting with me again for the fourth or fifth time, I guess. <laughs> and uh, be sure to check out not only his YouTube channel and his music, but also of course his website, earspasm.com where you can consult with him and, and learn about all the bass clarinets and everything all the way down to little tooth strips that you can <laughs> be purchasing on there. So Thank you so much, Michael. Anything else you wanted to add before we go? Thanks for having me. It's great. And thanks, thanks, Maury, for being here. Thank you, Maury, for that bass clarinet. I can't wait to get my paws on it again. The Clarinet Podcast is brought to you in part by one of my favorite products ever, Bova the Two-Way Humidity Control Packs. I live in a super dry and cold climate in Canada, and so taking care of my instruments is a real challenge. However, it's effortless with Bovida. Every three months, I just replace the Bovida pack in my case, and I know my clarinets will be comfy and cozy inside. If you use cane reeds, there's also a mini version that fits inside most reed cases and keeps your reeds at their best, so they're ready to play when you are. Check out Bovida's offerings for clarinetists at bovidainc.com and use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase. Click the link in the description below to learn more.